welcome to the Let's Talk presented by Leader Impact Awards. My name is Nolan Sharp. I've been living in Zagreb, Croatia uh, for over 20 years now. Um, we are really happy again to have leaders from all over Europe uh, joining us today. So uh, I'd like to ask you to um, maybe take a second to introduce yourselves uh, right in the chat where you're joining us from. Um, and, uh, and just say hello and say maybe the name of the city uh, that you're you're coming from. And, uh, um, so we can kind of say hello to one another. It's always really exciting and encouraging to see all the different places that people join us from. <laughs> so we have uh, Belgium, Macedonia, Romania here. Uh, I know we have people from Czech Republic, we have people from Croatia, uh, uh, Skopje, Macedonia, um, uh, Manchester, Prague. Uh, this is really, really great to see you. All. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the organizers of this. Leader Impact is a global movement. Uh, we have uh, networks of leaders in 51 countries, uh, around 350 cities around the world. And our mission is to help leaders have impact by growing professionally, personally, and spiritually. And that's the spiritual part that makes maybe makes us different than a lot of other organizations. Uh, we believe that's an important aspect that leaders really need to uh, to to grow in. Uh, we're off, we have today the possibility of following the webinar in Czech and in Ukrainian. Um, so uh, if you can you can select the language option if you want one of those two languages, but don't don't select it if you're going to follow in English. Just stay right here uh, if English uh, works for you. Um, so today we're going to have just uh, three parts to our to our webinar. First, we're going to hear from Henry about finding your why in business and life. Um, uh, then we're going to have uh, questions from the audience. So about 15 minutes we'll have open. Uh, the way this usually works best is when people write the questions in the chat box. Uh, and then you can write in your own language. Uh, so one of us will help you translate. Um, uh, you can write your questions while while Henry's speaking as well, so you don't have to try and remember later. Whatever piques your interest, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat, and we'll we'll kind of facilitate that um, uh, during the second part. And the third part is discussion groups. So we have smaller chat rooms available in several different languages, um, and Henry has given us some questions to think about, and uh, that'll be the last part of the time together. Once we go to the discussion groups and we break out, we'll stay there and and say goodbye. So um, without further ado, let me just introduce uh, Henry Kastner. He is the co-founder and partner at Sovereign's Capital, a private equity and venture capital fund that invests in faith-driven entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia and the US from its offices in Silicon Valley, Washington, DC, and Jakarta, Indonesia. Prior to this, he was the co-founder and previous CEO and then chairman of Bandwidth.com and its sister company, Republic Wireless, which spun out from Bandwidth in 2016. In addition to co-founding Faith-Driven Entrepreneur and Faith-Driven Athlete, Terry has been the catalyst behind the Faith-Driven Investor Movement. He also co-founded Durham Cares and was a founding board member of Praxis. Um, so to jump right in, Henry, you and your business partner, David Morkin, created such a unique culture at bandwidth.com that Harvard Business School wrote a case study about it. Um, so can you tell us the story of uh, that business and how you found your why and how uh, finding your why was an important part of the success of that. So without further ado, Henry, welcome. Hey, uh, Nolan, thank you so much. What a great pleasure, honor, and blessing it is to be with you all this morning. I feel like I'm having, you know, and this is something that all Americans want. All Americans want a form of a European vacation. So I get one this morning. I, I get up, I go for a run, I get my protein shake, and now I've got my European vacation. It's so neat to see people coming in on the meeting chat from all over that awesome, awesome continent. Um, I uh, am, my name is Henry K. Stern, as you said, of course, and I, I I'm, uh, live in Northern California. And, and uh, I, I believe that the reason that Nolan asked me to come on today is to share with you a bit about some of the experience that, that God has woven through uh, my corporate life. And uh, I do want to share with you a bit about Bandwidth. Bandwidth is this great company uh, that I got a chance to co-found with my best friend and business partner, David Morgan. And what we've come to find over the course of time, and this is 1999-2000, is that there have been aspects of the culture that, that God has allowed us to develop at Bandwidth, which gave us what we think is almost an unfair advantage. My hope this morning is that I might be able to share with you aspects of that that might be an encouragement to you as you lead businesses, as you interact in the marketplace. 
and I wouldn't suggest at all that this is the gospel according to Henry or the gospel according to bandwidth. And yet there are some, some things out there that uh, I think uh, are relevant for people, regardless of culture, regardless of where you are within an organization and where you are, regardless of where you are in terms of life cycle of a business. And so um, I'll start really at the beginning. Uh, so the year is 1999. And uh, I had met this guy, David Morgan, just a really super guy. And, uh, and I had had a business before. I'd just a bit of my personal background. Maybe we'll get a little bit to this later. But I had worked on Wall Street from 91 to 97. And then I uh, had started a company in the energy derivative space and then started wanted to start a telecom company. And so I did. But I didn't have this. I didn't have a domain name. So I cold called the guy, David Morgan, who owned the domain name bandwidth.com. And back then, if those of you are on the call old enough to remember, it was all about .com and domain names. And so I called him up and said, listen, here's the plan I have for the business. Uh, I'd love to have a, a, a domain name. And then I spent about two hours with him on the phone and really enjoyed being with him. I thought maybe this is a guy who might be my business partner. So he came to North Carolina where I was at the time. And we got together and we started talking about what might it look like to create a business together? And what would it be all about? And, and because this is a year in which 1999, 2000, this is a time where uh, corporate America was going from wearing suits and ties every day to work to one where you could wear like, I don't know, t-shirts and shorts and flip-flops to work. And so everything was changing in the corporate environment. It was all about culture. People, I remember people saying, oh my goodness, you know, this, this company down the block, they have a ping pong table, a table tennis table in their break room. And this was revolutionary, right? I mean, it sounds so silly now, but it's revolutionary. And so we thought in light of that, if we're going to start this company bandwidth, by the way, bandwidth today, bandwidth uh, provisions telephone numbers. So uh, telephone numbers and the software that enables them to go into production. So we, a customer of ours is Zoom. We do all of Google Voice. We do a lot of work with Amazon, Microsoft, and a lot of other big players. Uh, we also have this company that spun off called Republic Wireless, which we sold to Dish Networks, which takes cell phone calls and moves them between the cell phone network and the Wi-Fi network and back again. And then another company called Relay Go, which makes telephone equipment. OK, so that's what we're starting to plan to do. But we said, if we're going to do launch this company together, we have to be intentional about culture. And so uh, I remember David looking at me and saying, look, <clears throat> Okay, fine. If we're going to be intentional about culture, that's okay. But if it's going to have any staying power, it needs to mirror who we are as individuals. So that's my first encouragement to you today is what are the different aspects of culture that are important to you in your life as a leader? Because as you understand and inventory them, your ability to then express them as a part of your corporate culture is going to be an important part of it being able to stick around. So it's not just a bunch of nice things you put up on a, on a, a, a wall in a break room, but it's something that you live out. So David looked at me and said, what's important to us? Let's have that be the values that solidify and undergird our culture. And so we thought about it. And we both being Christians, uh, believe that faith was the most important thing for us in our lives. So faith was number one. And then number two, family. Number three, work. And then number four, fitness. And I'm going to take them in reverse order. I'm going to do it quickly. Reverse order on fitness. Um, uh, David, my business partner, is a world-class endurance athlete. I mean, he's amazing. Um, enters into 100-mile endurance runs. The world championships of the Ironman triathlon. I... I'm a neighborhood class endurance athlete, and I live in a neighborhood mostly of retirees, most of whom I can beat. But fitness has been a part of my life, too. And so we wanted to make sure that we created an atmosphere that would allow us to work out at lunchtime. And that started 20 years ago. If you look forward now, uh, it's been 20, you know, 24 years. We have about 1,100 employees, and two-thirds of them work out every day at lunchtime. That culture has been attractive to others that value exercise. And we believe exercise gives us an incredible opportunity to be able to interact with our employees. It allows us to get out and burn off steam and to have a healthy body, of course. But there's something really powerful about having a basketball team where the point guard is the CFO 
and the shooting guard is somebody who's in customer service. That type of cross-pollination is incredibly important. We hadn't planned on that. That's not why we did it. We did it because we selfishly wanted to work out at lunch, but it's ended up being that way and it's something we value. So we have in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is our corporate headquarters, we have the citywide champion ice hockey team, basketball team. We entered a team into the Trans Rockies. Rockies are a mountain range in the United States. Trans Rockies mountain bike race, and we finished second. And then we entered a team into the Race Across America, which America is thought of as the key endurance uh, race. We entered a two-man team and a four-man team, and we won it. So fitness is a big part of what we do. But for us, fitness is not as important as our work. When we work, we feel God's pleasure. By the way, for you leaders out there, and you are all leaders, one of the greatest gifts we can give our employees is meaningful work to do. We call it red meat to chew on. One of the best ways we can love on our employees is to give them meaningful work to help them understand how that work contributes to the overall goal of the company. And it gives them a sense of mission and purpose, helps them understand where they fit in the team. So oftentimes I've felt found leaders in my investment work that are not able to articulate what the mission of the company is. And a lot of it happens best when you th- do it through a vision. When you're able to say as a leader, here's where we're going. This is the mountaintop we are going to. And I want you to be able to feel it, almost taste it. What's it going to look like when we as a company have attained this? And then you go to everybody and say, your role over here, your role is to make sure we've got the right logistics. So we've got all the hiking supplies when you get up on the, on top. And you over here, you're going to make sure that we've got enough food. And you over here, you're going to make sure that we ascend on the right weather. And everybody in this company needs to know where we're going. And I want you to visualize and understand what it's going to look like and feel like and taste like when we've attained that together as a group. A lot of leaders tend to think that the mission is just self-evident and obvious to all of our employees. A lot of times it's not. Incredibly important to do that. Okay, so work is super important to us. But um, one time where, uh, and you might be saying, you know, if, if you're getting out there and, and you're working hard, you know, when, uh, and you're working off for an, uh, for an hour and a half at lunchtime, and you got some time for family, how does that all work together? Well, um, uh, we do a lot of our work after we put our kids to bed because family is more important than work. Okay, again, faith, family, work, fitness. Working backwards, we talked about fitness, then work, family. David and I have nine kids between us. Remember, David is world class. I He has six kids. I am neighborhood class. I have three kids. We want to be there for our kids' sporting events. It's really important for us. We want our children to understand that they are more important to us than our work. We end up also, of course, as I mentioned before, you know, wanting to do hard work. Um, so the question is, if you're going to your kids' sporting events and you are working out at lunchtime, um, when you get your work done, a lot of times it's late at night. But one night that doesn't happen is Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights for the last 25 years has been date night. Date night is an opportunity for me to take Kimberly, my wife, out and to let her know that indeed she is more important to me than my work is. If you're a business leader listening to this right now, you might be able to empathize and identify with this. It can be hard to shift gears going from work, 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 work. And if your wife is like my wife, she has a different pace than my senior vice president of marketing or my controller or some of the other people I have. And so what I found with time I need to do, because I do endeavor to love my wife better than my work, I have to prepare for that date night, that meeting differently than just an ordinary date night. I have to prepare for it almost like a business meeting. It's like for a half hour, I have to decompress. I have to pray and just say, I, over the next three hours, my intent purpose is to be a good husband. And so Lord, give me the right pace so that I can love her at her pace. So I have to prep for that meeting like I would any other type of meeting I have. It took me four or five years of pretty intense frustration before I kind of came to that. My hope is that if you pick up nothing else from me today, that you might have an opportunity to learn how to love your spouse well and to help them feel valued. And here's why. The shadow of a leader 
is incredibly important. I want to tell you a quick story on that. I do a podcast called the Faith Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. And it's broadcast in I don't know, 185 countries in the world because that's the way podcasts work. But one of the things that my, one of my co-hosts talks about is the shadow of a leader. He used to be the head of human resources at EA. EA is a sporting, uh, it's a, it's a um, video game company. He also was at Atari. And he talks about the fact that for the longest time at Atari, the CEO would wear dress slacks to work. They had something like 500 employees. And everybody else in the company wore dress slacks. Well, he left. He took another job. A new CEO came. He introduced himself to everybody. And on the first all-hands meeting, he wore jeans. The next day, without any change at all in the dress code, two-thirds of the employees were wearing jeans. Our employees, those we lead, will look to our behaviors. And if we model out things like the importance of fitness, and of course, the importance of work, which may sound self-evident, but the importance of family, they will model that too. They will follow that. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because I think that culture and the sense of meaning and purpose and belonging is more important than salary or career advancement or anything like that. It is important that people feel that they're part of something that is bigger than themselves, bigger than the manufacturer and distribution of widgets. When Harvard Business School came down and did a case study on the success of bandwidth, they looked at all these different types of factors. We were this small company that was uh, had a very difficult time in raising money. We went 0 for 40 in venture raises. So we tried to raise money. We're incredibly unsuccessful at it. So they're looking at how were we able to compete in many cases, win against some of the biggest companies in the world. And they looked at all the different types of metrics. And one that they really harped on was the fact that we had very little regrettable turnover. So if you're like me, if you're like me, you didn't get an MBA. I didn't get an MBA. I got through college. I sold t-shirts, part of my story. But one of the things that I've learned, and I tell this to MBA students when I teach them, is that all you need to know about business is as follows. Business is all about acquiring customers, and business is all about retaining customers. Those two things. If you're good at those two things, you're going to be very successful in business, acquiring customers and retaining customers. If you need to make it even simpler than that, and sometimes I do, and you want to distill it into one thing, I would tell you that the success in business, the success as a leader, is retaining employees. My business partner says he doesn't like the word retaining. David doesn't like the word retaining. He says it sounds like retaining water, water retention. He likes the idea of employee, re uh, employee promotion. But here's what we mean by that. You see, when you're able to find somebody who's really good at acquiring customers or somebody who's really good at retaining customers, by the way, if you have to choose between one of those two things as a leader, always choose to retain customers. One of the greatest myths in business that has accelerated over the last 10 years is that it's all about growth and it's all about new customers. The secret to an enduring company and organization is to delight your customers. Harvard Business School has done a study on this. They've found that it is five times more cost effective to replace a customer that was getting ready to churn than buying a new one. I'm sorry, five times more expensive to buy a new one than to just keep one that was going to otherwise retain return. Do you all understand? It's extraordinarily important. Our ability to delight our customer is really, really important. So back to the number one thing. When we train up our employees that are good at acquiring customers and even better yet, five times better yet, delighting our customers so that they stay and they refer other business into us, we don't want to lose them. So how do you not lose your employees? Well, yes, you create a culture that is about things like fitness and, and meaningful work. But beyond that, providing your employees in a, uh, an environment to love on their families well means that they stay with you. Over time, and this is over 24 years, we have found that the key advocate in employee retention is our employees' spouses. 
Okay, our employees are getting competitive job offers all the time. We are a successful technology company in North Carolina. And North Carolina has a, a massive influx of technology hirers. But when the husband comes back or the wife comes back and they talk to their spouse like, hey, I'm thinking about maybe taking this job over here at Apple or at Google or at Facebook. Their spouse says, hey, are they going to allow you to show up at all of our kids' football games? Right? Are they going to allow you to take off early and make sure that of the sanctity of date night? Over time, and I'll tell you, David and I would do this, it became harder and harder. We had two times each year where we brought all of our spouses together. It was incredibly important. And like we would prepare for our date night with our wife, we would prepare for these all hands meetings with the spouses. We would spend four hours going through all of our employees with their pictures. And because we had the benefits information, memorizing the names of their spouses so that we could welcome both of them. Because the best way for us to love somebody, and this gets harder when your companies get bigger, the best way is the best way we can love somebody is to remember their name and their story and their wife's name or their husband's name. If you can do that, out of a genuine desire to love on them. And that's one of the things I hope that came through. David and I look at business, not because we help our customers to save money on their telecom bill, though we do. And we have a mission to help our customers to unlock remarkable value. We do our business because we see it as a creative outlet for the gifts that God has given us and ability to lead and love people. That's why we do what we do. It just so happens we do that through telecom. But we can help these people and understand that we seek to love them and lead them well by understanding who they are and their story. That becomes very attractive. And without even knowing that that was the reason why we were able to compete, it was Harvard Business School that came back and said, you don't, leave, you don't lose employees. And that's a key because business school will otherwise tell you that there is a cost to replacing your employees. It's the cost of hiring a recruiter. It's the, hot, the cost of six months of ramp time until they kind of ramp back up. But I tell you that the real cost isn't even measurable. In America, we call it something called mojo. It's just the spirit of the company. It's the energy. The biggest changes and the biggest innovations that come at our company are from frontline workers who are interacting with our customers every day. When they're dialed into the mission and the culture, of what we are doing, they come up with great ideas about how to better serve customers. You don't want to lose that. If instead somebody is not thinking about the mission of the company and how to delight customers, and instead they're trying to think about, well, maybe I should take this job over here because the guy in the cubicle next to me left and took a job over at Google, then that whole creative mojo is lost. And you have lost the competitive advantage because you're in the marketplace where it's incredibly competitive. You've lost that competitive advantage. So business, in my estimation, is as simple as loving and leading your employees, understanding what your culture is, understanding your why, and then developing a culture that is then replicable to make sure that you are following through on it toward the end again of keeping your employees actively involved in your mission at your company. Wow, that was that was fantastic. Um, uh, uh, just I, I, I took a bunch of notes. I mean, I, I'm sure people have questions. You can you can start putting questions into the chat if you'd like for the for when we get to that um, after after I ask Henry one more question. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, you, you hit on so many great things. The, you know, the vision leaks. Leaders always think they've made the vision clear, and then you ask everybody around them, and and so often uh, there's a whole lot of confusion about what the the vision actually is. I think that's a point that Andy Stanley has driven home really hard. Um, but that's that's great. I mean, may, maybe you saved the fourth one, uh, uh, God, for uh, for uh, for for the next part, or whatever. But yeah, we. You know that I wanted to start off asking about the company itself, so that people could kind of get a um, uh, a sense for for the um, the business journey you've been on. But uh, you know, we have people here who are asking themselves, "What's my what's my why?" Simon Sinek really popularized that idea, and uh, 
Henry, you know, tell us about, you know, how you came to the why in life in general for you, you know, what's, what's behind creating a company with those values for you and what, what sort of, um, what's, what's your journey been like uh, through, through life and, and figuring out your why? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, of course. Um, so the, the biggest thing for us, of course, is faith. And, and I'd like to think that it's impossible to spend any meaningful time with David and I and not understand why we do what we do, the bigger why. And I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. But first, within the business context, before I get to the, the personal one, um, we uh, look for an opportunity to love on people uh, and get to know their stories, their personal stories. And the best way to do that is for us to model that out and to share our own personal stories. When you're a leader, um, uh, especially if you're a business owner, you have an opportunity to talk about it. It's appropriate for somebody joining your team to understand who it is that they're following and to share your story. Um, as David and I uh, started bandwidth and then as we continue to hire people, and this continues to this day, David goes out every week because I'm now more involved in, the, in Sovereign's Capital and the ministry. David, every week, we'll have a breakfast with new employees and talk about the founding story of bandwidth. And he'll talk about the fact that that Henry and I, in his words, you know, that David and I were founded bandwidth because we felt that this was the best expression of the gifts that God has given us. And that we're indeed called to help small, medium-sized uh, businesses that up until then had not been served well, that we wanted to be able to provide them with world-class service and technology. Because the other telecom companies that looked at serving the large corporates or the or the very scalable consumer markets. And there is this great unwash of the small to medium-sized business that needed to get internet connectivity and then progressively voice over IP and, and, and the services we offer today. And that we felt called, it was the best culmination of all the different gifts that God had given us in the marketplace. And that that is really important to us. And that we had these four foundational values of fitness, work, family, and then faith, and that it is our Christian faith that informs that. And as I do those, uh, those talks, I talk about how I came to faith. It's important to, to share that as my personal story, not in a prescriptive or a presumptuous way. It's just my story. And so I'd say, you know, so faith is really important to David and I. So you might ask, well, what, how did that start? And, like, and, and David was a lifelong Christian, so there's parts of my story that I think might be more relevant for many of our employees. And maybe some of the listeners to this might resonate with this as well. Um, I talked to them about the fact that I came to faith at age 28. I'm an adult convert. Um, my life, uh, you know, when I went off to college, I found my first love. And that was that I could make a t-shirt for $5 and I could sell it for 10. And even I could do that. I'm not good at math, but I could do that math. And I fell in love with entrepreneurship and business. I thought it was incredible. I, I felt alive in the process of doing that. And then I end up going and working on Wall Street and back in, and some of uh, these listeners will remember the original movie called Wall Street with Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen. And I wanted to be the guy that had the two phones up and I was dating a, 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 a blonde model and I was in an apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan with a sushi maker and my life was set to the soundtrack of Frank Sinatra. I wanted that badly. And my life at that point in time was characterized by this pursuit of happiness and of joy and excitement. And, um, and for those of you who have an active Christian faith, you know that a lot of times people talk about, about that that can never be completely satisfied. You try to fill it with all this different type of stimulus from dating and from partying and from making a lot of money. And at age 28, I felt super empty. I had achieved all the different things that were available in that movie, all the different things from success working on Wall Street, and I felt depressed and lonely. In fact, I took a week off of work and I was just just curled up in a in a ball. I just I was had so anxious and depressed and I had no idea why. Well, along the way I'd met a wonderful woman who's now my wife and we saw I saw an opportunity to start this business and moved to North Carolina to do it and we stumbled into a church. We thought, "Why well, don't we get married? Maybe we'll you know, we're in the South now. Everybody in the South seems to go to church. So maybe we'll check one out. And we walked in and there was a guy there who was preaching from the Bible as if it was true. And I thought, how does that, how does that happen? I had known that there was a Bible, 
But I thought that people actually thought that the Bible was true, where it's almost like a mythology. I thought that Christian was being a Christian was being nice to somebody. And I understood the love your neighbor part. So I knew is you could act Christian. But the fact that this guy who seemed to be confident, articulate, and intelligent actually believed that the Bible was true completely set me set me back. Uh, but curiosity brought us back a second time. And then it occurred to me on a run that you know what? I could get up to heaven and St. Peter's there for the entrance interview. And he's like, okay, Kastner, you read like a thousand books while you're on earth, but you never cracked the cover of the best-selling book of all time. I can't let you in. I'm like, gosh, it can't go down like that. That can't be my story. And so uh, when I got the Bible, and for those of you who are Christian or familiar with the Bible, you know that the Bible has a lot of pages. I'm like, I can't, I can't read all these pages, but I got through prep school by reading what we call the cliff notes, which are these summaries of the great classics. And I looked and I knew enough to know that the new Testament was the Christian part. So I read through the new Testament and the first time I read through it, it took me further away from faith. I thought, gosh, this is crazy. I mean, this, this Jesus, this Jesus has like a God complex as it turns out for good reason. But that's for another that's for another day and another talk. But it was in reading through it a second time that it 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 hit me, uh, and I think it was God through His Holy Spirit that oh my goodness this is true, and if it's true it changes everything. And so I came to understand why I existed. More importantly, I came to understand that there was a God who loved me more than I could ever ever dare imagine, even as messed up as I was. And I'll tell you, I did over those six years of working on Wall Street, I did just about as many things to take me further away from God. And um, and yet I, I came to understand that God, with all of that, still loved me. And it just, just completely overwhelmed me. And so when I sat down with my employees a couple of years after that experience, and then in the 24 years since then, I got gave them an opportunity to talk about that life transformation and a desire to live for him, to live for God, out of joy and gratitude for the gift given me. And that, that was the unique thing that bonded me together with David. And I want to make it very clear for those that came on board that they did not need to share that same faith story. But that faith is a value of bandwidth. And we want the people at bandwidth and Republic Wireless to feel very comfortable with bringing their whole selves to work. And if they are Jewish, for them to bring that to work. If they're a Muslim, for them to bring that to work. We want to be able to minister and be a community of whole people, not buying into a secular spiritual divide. We want to be able to have great conversations about people's faith journey and their culture and their community. Some of my Christian friends think that that's crazy. I mean, just even welcoming conversations about other religions in the workplace or alternate viewpoints on 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 life and marriage and and things like that and yet i think that it's really important for us as christ followers to be able to uh, to engage people in conversation we see paul doing that in the agora in athens and we want to be able to do that too even in the workplace because we think that truth stands out in the marketplace of ideas henry there's a brilliant question here from someone who has has asked how can you take care of frontline workers that they feel seen and I know that you're really good at this because I've seen you do it, but um, what are different ways that you have, have done that? So uh, SL, say that one more time because it, it was a difficult time picking you up at the beginning. Um, how have you taken care of frontline workers so that they feel seen? That's a great question. Um, you know, we're talking at the first part of the talk about the importance of culture. Um we had a guy came in uh, to do some graphic design work for our new website after we had about 10 employees. And um, we thought, gosh, at some point in time, we're going to be a big enough company where we should have a full-time marketing person. So let's go ahead and let's let's hire this person. His name is Chad Sattler. And uh, Chad uh, had done some consulting work with us and then came on board full-time. And about a week later, he said, oh, by the way, I don't do any writing. And like wow, you know, a marketer that doesn't do any writing, I mean, what do we do with that? But his graphic design was so good. The next week he came in and he said, oh, by the way, my name is no longer Chad Sattler. I'd prefer to be called Sledge. 
<laughs> what is this? What do we even make of this person? But he was so good at what he did with graphic design and did such a great job of loving on people that we decided to keep him. And 24 years on, he is known as the mayor of bandwidth. <laughs> and he celebrates our culture every day by endeavoring to understand the stories of all of our workers, knowing that some of the very best stories are those from those from people who have just started with us and those that are in customer service or in operations. We want everybody at Bandwidth to know everybody else's story because that's where they really feel valued. And we want to know it. We have a real authentic curiosity about understanding what somebody's experienced in life. And we think that that knits together culture more. So SL, I think one of the things is being able to celebrate everybody and be able in all hands meetings to be able to point out contributions that all levels of employees have made towards the creative mojo, if you will, of bandwidth. We also talked a little bit about how we try to uh, foster community with families through picnics and Christmas parties. Um, and then because one of our values is fitness, there's no better equalizer than sport. The soccer ball does not know how much money you make. The basketball has no idea that he, he, the basketball is now in the hands of a CFO or a customer service rep. No idea. It's a great equalizer. And we've seen that play out. And then we look to, to, to advance people. We want to make sure that they understand the role that they play and give them opportunities for advancement. So those are some of the things. Uh, another thing that uh, another thing I think is important is that we want our employees to be able to feel like they're contributors to the overall um, part of our culture that impacts community. So David and I have many philanthropic and ministry passions, and yet none of them show up at bandwidth. When we, we talk about some of the things, so we'll go on mission trips and we'll tell our employees where we're going and why we're going. And yet when it, we come to where we do our corporate philanthropy, those are ideas that have to come from frontline workers so that they feel an ownership of our commitment to love on the community through an initiative that we have called Bandwidth Cares. That's another, that's another way. And yet wow, we don't, to be clear, we don't do it. We definitely don't do it perfectly. We do a better job all the time, but those are some thoughts. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm, uh, you've been incredibly uh, uh, concise and yet also full of information. So maybe as people are, uh, I invite everyone now really uh, um, but but as uh, as uh, maybe we're getting some more questions, Henry, what, yeah, please do tell us a little bit more about now that you're no longer uh, full time at bandwidth. What is tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and uh, your work in philanthropy and the network you're building. And feel free to share. You can yeah. put links in the chat or put a slide up if you. Have oh wow! Something. Yeah. Hey, thank you, thank you for, uh, thank you for that. Oh, by the way, I see a, a question here. How many what? How many percent had jeans the next day with the new boss? Two thirds. Um, so what am I doing now? So um, like 10 years into bandwidth, um, David and I felt really encouraged by our ability to um, hopefully bear witness to our culture and our faith through the marketplace. But as we came across other Christian uh, business owners, and entrepreneurs, particularly those that had taken venture capital, we found from them that they really felt pressures, either real or just inferred from their investors to not talk about their faith and kind of buy, they had bought in collectively to this concept of a spiritual secular divide, uh, which is very interesting actually, because we do a lot of investing in emerging markets now where that's not the case, primarily in Africa, there's not this secular spiritual divide, the spiritual impact, every aspect of community in, in the workplace, but that's, that's for another topic. Um, but we um, wanted to be able to create a ministry to be able to encourage other Christian business owners. And the first iteration of that was by setting up a fund. We, we knew that we had assets to invest, but instead of investing in an index fund or just hiring a money manager, we wanted to invest in other Christian entrepreneurs and come alongside them and to help them through things like customer acquisition costs and intellectual property and channels to market, but then also to share our story and some of the things I just shared with you about. What does it look like to love and lead in a way that bears witness to our faith but it's not overly prescriptive or presumptuous about our faith. How do we wrestle through that ambiguity in the marketplace? And so that began Sovereign's Capital. And that started 11 years ago. And through the grace of God, that's been very successful. And we have more than $500 million of assets under management, all investing in faith-driven entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, 
Uh, it's primarily in Indonesia, Singapore, and in America. But then five years into, uh, into sovereigns, because so many people are coming to us and saying, hey, can you invest? And we're like, I'm so sorry. It's the wrong industry. It's the wrong stage or the wrong geography. We started a ministry called Faith Driven Entrepreneur to encourage all Christian entrepreneurs. And we do that through content and community. We do that through blogs and podcasts and a conference. Uh, last year, we had more than 400 watch parties for the Faith Driven Entrepreneur Conference around the world. We have listeners from more than 185 companies on the podcast, which is so great because we don't have to say no anymore to those people. And then we have groups where uh, faith-driven entrepreneurs will get into groups with their peers and go through 10-minute mini documentaries of a story and then teaching from a J.D. Greer or a Tim Keller or other ministry leaders and then have facilitated conversation with their peers. And we've had more than 10,000 go through those groups. And then we started a ministry on the heels of that called Faith Driven Investor to help entrepreneurs that have been successful financially along with other investors to understand how they might steward the resources that God has entrusted them with. More vocational and faith-driven entrepreneur, but more financial resources and faith-driven investor. So they're at market investing, patient or concessionary capital, which a lot of times you'll see in frontier and emerging markets like Africa, and then also philanthropy. And to do the same type of thing, to do that through content and community where groups of 12 or 15 will get together and say, gosh, how do we, how do we think about developing an investment policy? How do we come up with a framework? And the operating thing behind that is not to be prescriptive or presumptuous, but hopefully to lead a group of entrepreneurs and investors through a process where they might just get on, on their knees with their spouses and ask God, how might you have us store this, these financial resources you've entrusted us with for your glory and under your power and building your kingdom? And so that's faith-driven investor. Thanks for asking. Faithdrivenentrepreneur.org. Maybe SL will put in. Oh, my goodness. She, yeah, she did. She did, me. yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And again, uh, we're, we're doing great with time. So we have a solid 15 minutes now uh, for people to ask questions. Uh, you can ask about, uh, te you know, technical aspects about entrepreneurship, um, uh, um, uh, you know, or, or more about the, the personal aspects of how lead the company. Um, uh, yeah. So let's uh, feel free to, um, uh, to, to chat, to, to write them there. I think Christoph asked one question. Um, let me see. I think he asked, what was the USP, the unique selling proposition of uh, faith of an entrepreneur compared to Leader Impact? Well, we're all friends here, so uh, I don't know if you want to uh, Leader trying. Impact. So Leader, leader Impact's ability to get leaders together across different aspects in the marketplace, in community within Europe is Outstanding, it's great community, great culture. You're getting experience of that through through today. Um, okay. We at Faith Driven Entrepreneur tend to be very much the top end of the funnel. It's our mm -hmm. mission to see. This sounds crazy, but to see 100 million Christian entrepreneurs around the world be activated, equipped, and encouraged. We do that pretty scalably. We do that through content, and you'll see our. You'll see this if you go to the website, you'll see the content that we have available. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we partner with organizations like Leader Impact, um, with a guy named Valter Droppers, who's, who you'll see on this. Yeah, on he's this also page. on this class. Yeah. And with others that have decades of relational connections within a community where they can go really, really deep with the leaders that they serve. We tend not to go super deep. Uh, because we want to, there's a passage in, in scripture from Ezekiel calling the Valley of Dry Bones. We want to be able to help activate that. But we looked at other organizations and their missions, organizations like the Navigators that do such a great job of life on life discipleship and working. So Leader Impact is one that does that well. And so partnering with them so that you might get involved in a Leader Impact, the Leader Impact networking community to go deeper with your peers, super important. That's, that's a, short, a short question in addition. So so would that mean that leader impact is, so to say, a preparation stage for a Christian entrepreneur or a face-driven entrepreneur? Sorry, sorry. So, so would you say leader impact is to bring non-Christians over the bridge, Jesus Christ, and after that, they could follow you? 
I'll let Nolan uh, speak to that. Yeah, I think I think maybe that's uh, wandering from our topic for for today a little bit. I mean, I I think uh, um, it's been a great process for me personally. I've been I feel like I've been drinking through a fire hose the last year or so of realizing how many really interesting uh, organizations there are. I mean, I I'm right now in Prague <laughs> to to be in another to be at another meeting for the European Great Commission collaboration. I think we're all learning so. I would say, you know, you can, it's a great topic to ask your local, since we mainly advertise this through Leader Impact, ask your local Leader Impact to leader some about, um, and, uh, uh, but no, it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting to see what, what is happening all over the world uh, in many new ways. I've been doing this for more than 20 years in this kind of space, and it's been really um, exciting for me just uh, to see what's hap- been happening in the last few years. Um and I was, I, if, uh, maybe I'd ask you a question. Uh, my work experience in Silicon Valley was around the time you guys started. And so I, I managed to miss the age of uh, ubiquitous cell phones and um, uh, on, you know, always on internet uh, in business and stuff. And so I, I guess maybe two things like, what, what do you see in generational changes? Uh, I think with uh, Gen Z in the workplace, maybe, or, you know, with those four values you start out with, I they were just fantastic. But um, what have you noticed about as the pressures that um, the culture changes, you know, Gen Z, their, their way of coming to work, and then maybe also things like, uh, you know, just having constant access to your cell phone, you know, did that, how did that, where you started kind of rub up against, you know, the, the, the changes we've been seeing in the workplace in the past couple of decades? So um, that's a great question. Was life better in the 1950s and 1960s, 1970s before all this, before all this happened? So we actually, we, we do this podcast. And the other day we had a guy named Andy Crouch on the podcast, like yesterday, Andy Crouch and his daughter, Amy, were on the podcast and they wrote a book called The Tech Wise Family. And it was fascinating to talk about that with him and just on this very thing. So was life better in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, when we didn't have these impersonal options of having a kind of quasi relationship with people? And in many ways, it feels like to me, yes, life was better. But now that we've seen all these kind of substitutes for real relationship, does that actually, and then we have with the emergence of AI, is that actually a special blessing to actually take a step back and ask us something that we probably didn't ask ourselves in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, which is what makes us uniquely human? We're on screens and we've been around screens. You know, there's the novelty aspect of checking on what people are doing on Facebook and Instagram. That was kind of neat and cool. But now that we realize that that doesn't really satisfy, just kind of like with me in Wall Street. Six years, I'm going after all the things that were new for me. I'm away from my parents. I'm away from school. All these different types of things I can explore and all that stuff. And that was cool for a couple of years. And yet I realized that it didn't deliver. I think that there's a whole awakening and emergence of people asking really hard questions about what's the meaning of life in a world in which technology can write my term paper for me. What does it mean for me to be uniquely human? In a world in which I'm just following Instagram, I'm seeing all these people dress up and do these funny skits and stuff like that. And I realize at the end of it that I'm hollow and I hear about another teen suicide. What's really going on? And so I think it can be a real blessing. Now, to be clear, even in our neighborhood, we know of just extreme tragedies. And yet, I also think that this is an incredible awakening for people to say, what's real? What do we really believe? What's really going on here? I mean, is this kind of like this, some sort of like crazy reality game? I'm in the matrix type of thing. I think that people are starting to ask existential questions like, why do I exist? What makes me human? Is there a God? Is that God knowable? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? Because in Silicon Valley, since you've left, we've had a great 20 years of really exploring the concept of relative truth, relativism. Whatever is true for you must be true. And yet the sense I'm getting from the friends that I talk to, both those that are Christian, non-Christian, are like, that experiment hasn't really worked. And so I think that there's a great opportunity for a great awakening. I think it's a great time to be alive. Uh, that, I, I really appreciate you saying that because it can be so easy to, uh, to be discouraged <laughs> by so many things going on. We have a great question from Elvis uh, from Romania. He says, what would you encourage entrepreneurs to do better uh, to implement their why and be consistent at it? In other words, what are the biggest obstacles in being intentional and consistent in your why? 
Well, that's a great question. So the first thing, Elvis, and for all of us, myself very much included, is to ask ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. And then to ask ourselves that again. You know, like, really, really, why? So for me, I mean, ostensibly, so why am I on this call with you all? Okay. Ostensibly, it's to bring God glory. Ostensibly, it's to share uh, and to encourage other leaders with some aspect of what I learned. And we could turn the tables very easily. And Elvis could spend 45 minutes telling his story and the things he's learned. And I would be a beneficiary of that. It just so happens that all you guys got was me. So um, what, you know, maybe that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Or maybe why I'm doing this is because I like to have my ego stroke. And it's really cool doing this in Europe with a bunch of people from a bunch of different countries I've never been to. Or maybe it's because of some other deep insecurity I have, or maybe it's just the approval of my peers, or maybe it's because I want to impress SL because SL is on my team, or maybe I don't even know. But here's one thing I do know, and I think that this is reinforced a lot of times in the wisdom of scripture. And this is something that Jews and, and Christians alike share. And it's in Proverbs. Proverbs 16.2 is all of a man's ways seem pure to him, but his motives are weighed by the Lord. And if you didn't get it, you know, remember, for those of you who know, there are 31 Proverbs. There's one for every day of the month. So you always know where you are. Okay. If you did, if that didn't convict you enough on the 16th day of the month, it comes back on the 21st. Proverbs 21 2 <laughs> says the same thing again. So you've had five days to think about, like, really, why am I doing what I'm doing? And so what I try to do is I have a, a group of my friends that are my accountability partners that are to ask me. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Like, really, why? And that can be really convicting. It helps expose real issues that I have, exposes pride. It exposes, I'm an investor. So the best passage in the Bible that really impacts me on investing is the parable of the sower. If I can get through, the, the, and there's a, this story in the Bible, okay? The sower's out there sowing seeds. And there are three different things that can call it, they can hold it back from really taking root. One is that the birds come and pick it up. Another one is that the sun scorches it. But the third one is that the vines and the thorns would encircle the growing plant and cause it to not flourish. And for me, I'm always worried about that. And the Bible tells us that those, those, the, the, those thorns, those vines are the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Right? Am I doing business really because I really want to love on my neighbor and use all of my God-given gifts? Or is it because I want to be financially successful and buy the next toy? I have to ask myself these things all the time. But the problem is, is that I have these like glasses on that are like, they're calling me to be like, like colorblind. I can't even see the vines that are encircling me. So I have to do it with friends of mine that don't have the same type of glasses on. They're not colorblind. So they can see these things. Because if I can get through that, if I can get through that, the Bible says I'll have a return of 30, 60, or 100 fold. And I'm an investor. That's an awesome. I mean, to get a 30 extra return is really, really, really good. And so the question that you have, Elvis, is the, it starts off before you can really share your why. Because, because human beings are really, really smart. They can tell whether you have conviction and authenticity and integrity in how you answer the question why. The first step is to really know why. And when you can talk about your why and be able to be honest with the fact that you are still a sinful person and that you're still kind of messed up, that becomes really winsome. And I think that, that people will follow that. They don't, want, they don't want to just follow a leader that's perfect. They want to follow a leader they can relate to. They want to see some of the struggles that you're struggling with. That's somebody worth following. That's a person who understands me and my struggles. This person is just like completely perfect, completely nailed. You know, that's unattainable. They're never going to get the challenges I've, I'm going through. Great. That's that's that was, uh, really um, great to hear. Uh, another good question asked uh, from uh, Diana uh, says, how high should the standards be in Christian based companies? How do you keep the balance between profit and care? Um, uh, every business at the end is still money oriented. So like, uh, yeah, that's a dilemma for a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it's a, um, gosh, I don't want to get overly preachy here, but here's a standard that I think helps guide me through what we do. There's a Swiss French theologian 
named uh, Francis Schaeffer, who said, it's the degree that we do our work well, that we have an opportunity to witness and be heard. And when we are in the marketplace, our ability to have a sustainable business and to be able to flourish and to be able to deliver a return to our stakeholders and opportunities for advancement for our employees comes from our ability to be financially sustainable, profitable, and excellent in all aspects of what we do. I do think that if all we do is focus on the financial bottom line, we will not find it. I think that if we focus on things like delighting our customer and delighting our employee, by the way, in America, there's a retail chain called Chick-fil-A that makes chicken sandwiches. They have something 2,000 plus outlets. They're reasonably famous in America. If you ever come to America, you'll love this. It's really good. So they're famous for delighting their customer. These 16, 17-year-old people go ahead and they give you your food and they say, and you say, thank you. And they look at you and they say, it's my pleasure. Like, what? I never get that at Burger King and McDonald's. There's something amazing about Chick-fil-A. And so I spent some time with the, some of the senior management at Chick-fil-A. And I said, look, how do you hire for that? How do you do that? And how do you go ahead? What are the personality tests you go through and the ongoing training? And they're like, you know what? We do a little bit there, but that's not where our focus is. Our focus is on delighting our employees. Because we stand no chance for that employee to look at a customer and say, it's my pleasure, if they had to trip over an extension wire, or you're late with a paycheck, or they had to park five minutes away. Or as in our case, they had to squeeze lemons for 10 minutes before work because we do fresh squeeze lemonade. We look to make our employees as happy and as fulfilled as possible. And it's only then that we have an opportunity to delight our customers. So for us, if we focus just on the financial bottom line, we won't get it. I'm almost positive of that. If we focus on delighting our employees, delighting our customers, understanding that we have an opportunity given by God to, to give him glory through what we do, if we concentrate on those things, I believe that we'll find those things and we'll find financial success. We flip the priority around, we won't find it. So that's kind of the upside down world without logic. So you cannot have a sustainable business that's not financially successful. But if that is your sole focus, you won't find it. And by the way, if you articulate that to your employees, like the ultimate bottom line, this is Milton Friedman in 1972. It's like the only purpose of business is to deliver to shareholders. Who wants to follow that? You won't find it. Milton Friedman was never an operator. He's a great, he's a great communicator, great thinker, great academician. I don't think that he ever led a business in his life and really understood the importance of human capital. Wow, that's that, that is a fascinating, fascinating point. I really I appreciate you saying that. I don't know what it's like in some of the other countries represented here, but I feel like Croatia is one place where um, the balance has finally shifted. Like in the last five years or so, so many people left the country. So many people uh, that um, that we finally have a scarcity of employees, and so the things you're talking about. Um, are finally really, really important to us that, that in business that you actually, you kind of, you keep your, your employees happy because otherwise you lose them. And um, I think it's been um, uh, very, very relevant what you're sharing in so many places today in Europe as well. Um, well, this has been, this has been fantastic. I think uh, Stephen wrote and um, uh, asked whether we can receive a copy, recopy the recording. I said at the beginning, that uh, this is being recorded. We'll put it on the uh, YouTube page for Leader Impact Europe. Uh, it's pretty easy to find in general. And if you registered uh, for the uh, webinar, I'll send out a, um, uh, a follow-up in a couple of days once we have the, the recording.